I want. <laughs> you think there's going to be anything wrong with that rental car that Tesla provides them? <laughs> yeah. No. It's going to no. be a pretty good one. Uh huh. And that. Uh, that's why people are on really consumer reports. The advice provided on this podcast is general advice only. All statements made are considered by the participants to be accurate, but accuracy cannot be guaranteed. It has been prepared without taking into account your objectives, financial situations, or needs. All participants in this podcast, including guests, may have a financial interest in any or all of the products or services mentioned. Before acting on this advice, you should consider the appropriateness of the advice having regard to your own objectives, financial situations, and needs. If any private products are detailed on this podcast, you should obtain a product disclosure statement relating to the products and consider its contents before making any decisions. Where quoted, past performance is not indicative of future results. Welcome to the Money Path Podcast with your host, Bob Iacchino and Mike Arnold, founders of Fat Trading Partners. Make sure you check out Motive Wave software at fattradingpartners.com and download your 14 day free trial. So let's join Bob and Mike with a conversation of news and the markets. Like, I have a lot of really old Macintoshes that I only use to play classic Atari games. Like, mm-hmm. really, uh, really old, old Atari games. Like, the original Atari games. And there's no way to play those old original Atari uh, games right now. Ah, uh, but guess what? <laughs> there's an indie... Atari launched an Indiegogo campaign. It's already fully funded to get the Atari VCS. The It's the new, the rebooted Atari. Uh, very, very interesting thing. Let's see, I'm on the Indiegogo page right now. You're going to be able to play all the old games plus the new games. You'll be able to download them and stream them. They have a a redesigned, like, classic version of their joystick plus a new controller. You can get the the collector's edition, uh, which has which has real wood paneling on the front instead of the fake wood paneling, you know? I'm, pff, come on. See, the thing about Atari is the reason that that console way back in the 70s lasted for a decade is because programmers could constantly be hacking that code to improve the graphics. It kind of was a, something without a walled garden. You know, Activision was able to create more and more graphical sprites and Pitfall came out. Pitfall? Oh, I played a lot of Pitfall back in the day. So the thing is, is if this Atari running Ubuntu Linux, if you can really get root access to this console, that could be a game changer. I mean, if you can hack this thing to death, it will survive. If it's just going to play a bunch of retro games, it's not the right solution for that. No, I think the fact that they're, you know, putting out a Linux box, oh, it'll be hacked. It'll be hacked today before it's released. So <laughs> it's going to be turned into a, oh, a emulation machine beyond all emulation machines, I think. You'll be able to play everything on this box. Atari, this isn't even a real company. These guys just kind of bought the license to the name and the games for, you know, a couple pennies. Not really a couple pennies, but figuratively. And they kind of, I don't think they care. I just, I really hope that they're using kind of that old school model of we're just going to build this stuff and let it go wild. That's what I'm hoping for because, you know, it's, it's, I want somebody to reboot Yars Revenge. (laughs) The funny thing is I was playing Yars Revenge just a couple days ago. Really? (laughs) Yeah, running my emulators on like 15 year old Macintoshes. Have you ever played Yars Revenge, Bob? I have never even heard of Yars Revenge. So right now, as of, let me hit refresh one time, just so we get an accurate number as of June 1st. uh, We are at, for the backing of this campaign, we have 8,718 backers, raising a total of 2.267 million. I think Atari does need redemption because, you know, that Atari logo is in the movie Blade Runner from 1984, right? It, that Atari logo and name is such an iconic brand that has been forgotten. Boy, I really hope they do this right and you can just root this thing to death. 
Yeah, well, that's why it's leading off the show. Come on, what better <laughs> way to talk about a company that went to zero? <laughs> yeah, they went to minus. Speaking of going to zero, huh? Speaking of going to zero, yeah. Do oh. you, you look at Blue Apron? Oh, no, I haven't looked at Blue Apron. Yeah, I thought you were going somewhere else because I look at my next story. We'll get back to Blue Apron, but I just wanted to touch on oh, what's, what's going to Deutsche Bank, <laughs> <laughs> which has been in a going to zero segment now for a couple of years. It, yeah. did, did you see that they were uh, put on the troubled watch list by the Fed over troubled a year ago? Condition status. Yeah. What is that? Uh, it's the sort of lowest designation that the Fed uses to um, sort of attribute the, the health of a bank, so to speak. When they're in troubled condition, they their literal recommendation is that they reduce risk, fire people, cut costs, blah, blah, blah. So it's it's bad. Yeah, this uh, the downgrade took place secretly about a year ago and finally came out this last week. The U.S. system for rating banks is called CAMELS, C-A-M-E-L-S, which stands for Capital Adequacy, Asset Quality, Management, Earnings, Liquidity, and Sensitivity to Market Risk. A bank's top-line rating from 1 to 5 takes into account all those categories. The best rating is 1. Troubled banks are rated either a 4 or a 5, and the scores aren't made public, so Deutsche Bank is either a 4 or a 5. I'm betting a (laughs) 5. (laughs) <laughs> there's nobody who can essentially bail them out there's no other bank that can bail them out they're the largest european bank and their derivative stuff is a mess and that's what's really starting we've talked about their derivatives that being the biggest risk and that's really starting to light things up now counterparty risk and we'll have to touch on what's going on in spain and italy too because that's you know that spooked the markets a lot this week although now it seemed to possibly have turned a corner but deutsche bank down to 1057 new all-time lows or all new time lows however you want to put it <laughs> uh now we can go well, i have to look at i missed blue apron aprn what is what's going on with blue apron well i just saw one of the the sort of advisory services that I keep an eye on uh, that I won't mention because we're not trying to endorse anybody here, but one of the advisory services I watched put out a sell and I saw the sell was at $3. <laughs> I was like, Christ, I haven't looked at this chart forever. So where is it? And I looked at it, I'm like, oh my God, we, <laughs> I know that Mike's been talking about it being in just you know technical trouble in terms of price action for quite a long time. And I just had no idea how bad it had gotten. Yeah, I mean, we're off well off the lows. I mean, it, uh, we're finally above the weekly rotation zone. So I don't know what's changed with their business model, though. I, I think it's just rallying of speculation that somebody's going to come in and and gobble it up at some point. But yeah. it's been rallying now since uh, mid or beginning of April, where it hit a low of 172. Now it's at 317. Mm-hmm. So. But uh, again, you, uh, sell rating should have been done when it was trading maybe nine, eight, seven. <laughs> oh, we're at uh, three. Okay. <laughs> I don't even know what to title this segment, but it's going to be in the frivolous and bad lawsuit category. <laughs> okay. Did you see this one? Uh, this is priceless. Uh, two McDonald's customers in Florida are suing the fast food uh company for a five million dollars because they're saying they'll be unfairly charged for cheese they don't want in their burgers Aye. so their their whole lawsuit is you can get a regular hamburger or you can get a cheeseburger you know and they charge you more for the cheeseburger of course but the only option for a quarter pounder is a quarter pounder with cheese now you can ask you can order that quarter pounder with cheese and ask for no cheese but they don't discount the price because it's they only have a quarter pounder with cheese on the menu. So they're suing for $5 million because they think it's unfair. They're, they don't want the cheese, but they're, they're having to pay for a quarter pounder with cheese. <laughs> wow. That's the way the burger comes. That's it. Yeah. You, you can't order a quarter pounder with – there's no quarter pounder on the menu. It's not like a quarter pounder with cheese and a quarter pounder – uh, you can only order the one with cheese, and they'll not give you the cheese if you don't want it. So they're just not gonna give you like you get a 
and any restaurant, if you ask for a modification that takes things off the 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 dish you're ordering, you, they don't give you a discount or a refund. <laughs> yeah, why would they? Well, I guess I'd like my salad, but I don't want cucumbers in it. Oh, great, sir. That's going to be 50 cents cheaper on your salad because we don't have to put cucumbers on it. I think I most mean, people listening to us understand this, but there's a process that goes into the cost of something. And when you change the process, it actually increases the cost. While it may decrease the food costs, it increases the cost of making the darn thing. So, but who, what lawyer takes this? <laughs> who needs practice? The lawyer needs yeah. practice. Can, they, can I sue them for lack of nourishment? <laughs> and $5 million because you think you're overpaying like 50 cents for that because pe- you didn't get your 50 cents. How many cheeseburgers or quarter pounders with cheese have you ordered and feel, felt you've been overcharged to sue for $5 million? <laughs> <laughs> and if this is causing you mental anguish and distress, then you have bigger problems. <laughs> Ridiculous. Maybe they should get a job instead of trying to sue for five thousand dollars, which takes us to the jobs report. Look at that tie-in. Actually, I think you should delete that tie-in because it assumes that these people suing don't have a job. Oh, I like my tie-in. Come on, Stafford ruling. Give me credit. If you listen to the show, you'll hear what the ruling is. All right, perfect. The, the edit always rules. <laughs> <laughs> Job report was a blowout number today. Um, it was expected. I saw estimates of 189 and estimates of 190, so we'll call those the same. But the uh, number came out at 238, the headline number. Unemployment rate fell from 3.9 to 3.8 percent. Labor force participation rate fell for a third straight week, which normally would kind of take the enthusiasm of that drop in the unemployment rate away a little bit. But the U6, the gauge of all unemployed whether they're looking for a job or not, also fell. So there's more to that story. We have record numbers of unfilled positions because of uh, what people are calling sort of a skill set gap between people, uh, jobs that need to be filled and the people having the skills to fill those jobs. Um, According to this job report, the economy's roaring. Now, the big takeaway is that year over year wage increases went from an estimate of 2.7% to 2.8%. Actually, 2.6, I'm sorry, was the estimate. So year over year, and that's a big deal because the year over year has more data in it than the month over month does. But the month over month was expected to increase by 0.1 and it increased by 0.3. So that's a big jump as well. So wages are starting to climb in a very real way. The 10-year note and two-year note yields both increased after the number stocks. Again, we're recording this at, it's about 11.15 central time on Friday and uh, the Dow is up about 1% as we speak to you guys. Actually, let me get an update here. Yeah, 0.96%. So that's pretty positive. The probability of a 25 basis point rate hike after this number came is now at 93.8%. Yesterday, it was, let me get the exact number, but it was in around the 78% level. Um, it was yesterday. Well, that's not right. That's May 1st. Yesterday, it was at 87.5%. So today, it's at 93.8% post that number. So nothing really bad you can point to, except potentially that people knew what the number that the number was going to be good before it came out. And how did they know that? <laughs> President Trump tweeted, looking forward to seeing the jobs number this morning. Um, I, I'm not going to judge whether that was... I'm not going to judge any of it because we don't do politics here. Having said that, the president gets the number the night before under like heavy security, right? There's no, I'm not going to say there's no possible way, but I would never say anything that stupid. But he gets it like he's the only one who gets to see it. Maybe he shares it with his advisors. But it's absolutely a no-no to share that data early. And he did not. But he did tweet looking forward to seeing the numbers prior to the number coming out. And you can, the market started rallying before the numbers came out based off of that tweet. So it was a super interesting thing as to whether um, or not that's construed as him releasing the numbers. Legally, he can't. So I'm guessing that it was legal for him to tweet what he did. I don't think it was a, it was a violation of any sort of law. But the markets definitely took it as a positive. And the reason I bring it up is because next month when there's no tweet, do people say that that's because he got sort of 
uh, reprimanded by whoever can reprimand the president for doing it, or is it because the number's bad? See, that's the big thing. Well, now that's, <laughs> is that's the slippery slope. So if he tweets or doesn't tweet, or maybe doesn't tweet next month and tweets in two months, yeah. <laughs> he shouldn't. Have, he shouldn't have done that. Whether it was no. legal or not, is it? That's one thing. Well, I'll, I'll say on this show because it has to do with with trading and investing. He shouldn't have done that. Yeah, but the number's great. Going back to the number, and then by the way, we had a bunch of ISM numbers after that, and construction spending numbers as well, um, that were blowout numbers, that were fantastic numbers. Construction spending was the highest uh, month over month change since January of 2016. I mean, there are strong economic numbers. The Atlanta Fed last week lowered their GDP estimates from 4.1 to 4.0. My guess is they're going to ratchet it back up a bit. I know they don't have a new estimate out yet, right, Mikey? Uh, they, I don't, I, I saw the one earlier this week. I don't know when the next one's coming out. I didn't pay close enough attention to that. But because that, they're that, I, I, I stopped following that as close. I followed that for about two years, and that thing swings so wildly, it wildly, it's crazy. Their model, so. Sort of like the cryptocurrencies do. Yeah. So, because I bring that up because now uh, there's a Scottish crypto clinic now treating Bitcoin trading addicts. Wait, what? So, a Scottish hospital is treating people who are addicted to trading cryptocurrencies in the UK's first ever crypto clinic. Crypto clinic. Yes. The Castle Craig Hospital in Peeblesshire. The Scottish Borders has created a course of residential treatment for those it deems to be crypto addicts. Experts told the Evening Standard that crypto trading can become a form of behavioral addiction with traders obsessively glued to minute-by-minute -minute market fluctuation. The DeFi's treatment program is therefore closer to existing methods for treating gambling addictions rather than the substance abuse programs. Quote, the high-risk fluctuating cryptocurrency market appeals to the problem gambler. It provides excitement and an escape from reality. Bitcoin, for example, has been heavily traded and huge gains and losses were made. It's a classic bubble situation, end quote. Wow. So, it's so uh, dumb, I don't even have a joke. <laughs> it's so dumb. There are all sorts of problems in the world. Yeah. Now, here you go. Here's one thing you don't want to do. Uh, last year, Cointelegraph reported a Bitcoin investor who used his home as collateral for a 325000 equity loan and pursuing making a mid-term profit in the cryptocurrency markets. <laughs> you don't want to take out a home loan to trade <laughs> cryptocurrencies. That's our advice, okay? <laughs> Risk capital only. Certain coins will go to zero. I think I can say that S certain coins at some point will go to zero. Yes, for sure. So, uh, and that's our going to zero segment. <laughs> 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 oh, I actually don't, we already touched on Deutsche Bank, so I don't have anything else in going to zero. Uh, funny enough, I don't have anything else about Amazon taking over this week. Uh, we talked about GDP. Now Goldman raises the Q2 GDP estimate for, for from 3.4 to 3.7. They they raised it quote downward revisions in Q1 inventories and the better than expected April trade data suggested a faster pace of growth in Q2. Uh, Q1 GDP was revised down to 2.2 from 2.3 earlier. That was the first revision in uh, Q1 GDP. Oh, and we had the Fed's beige book. What what did uh, the our favorite beige book say? Anything? Yeah, I'm going to paraphrase. The beige book basically said growth, like tremendous growth in all areas, except the Dallas Fed, which had good growth. So, and that has to do with, uh, I mean, that's such an oil patch thing when you're talking about the Dallas Fed. So much of it has to do with the oil patch. So, uh, yeah, really, really good. That's all you need to know. <laughs> growth everywhere, according to the Fed. Growth everywhere. Yeah. What growth, you growth we, we've, everywhere, as the kids say today. We've also had, there's been a lot of tariff stuff back in yeah. the news this week. What's going on with that? What should, what should be our takeaway from the tariff stuff? 
Well, I have to separate my political opinion from the from the economic impact, and the economic impact is overall slower trade. And I don't necessarily mean for any one country; I mean overall. Um, that's what tariffs do. People, you know, I love when people say tariff is just a fancy word for tax. Well, I don't think it's that fancy. It's got a few more letters, but yeah, it's a tax. And tariffs are around for two specific reasons: income or punishment. That's it. So the only time tariffs could be used and not be a bad thing, and by the way, there's a lot of tariffs on U.S. US goods that other companies have put on us. Don't let anyone fool you that there's not, right? There are. Other countries have put tariffs on the U.S. for a long time. Whether this is the way to change that or not, I don't know. I'm not commenting on that. Here's the thing. Tariffs can be used in a sort of economically ethical way to help emerging markets that are struggling with competition. I could see that. You have a poor country that wants to sell something somewhere, and they also want to protect their own industry. So mutually agreed upon tariffs by a couple of countries are put in place. So, But overall, tariffs slow trade, and they increase the price of trade back and forth. So Canada has announced retaliatory tariffs. Now, I can only say this because Mike is Canadian. They did it in a sort of like stereotypically nice Canadian way. They put tariffs on 16 billion of U.S. products in retail or on U.S. goods in retaliation for um, the steel and aluminum tariffs, where the executive branch didn't really give any sort of uh, exemptions to anyone, including allies, for the most part. So Canada is getting tariffs imposed on steel and, and aluminum. So the Canadians did a bunch of products. They did metals, which makes sense. But they also did like nail polish. And in a uniquely Canadian way, how they're so nice, they did it on candles, not including birthday candles. <laughs> Take off, it's eh? Good idea, eh? Yeah, it's, they're like literally like we a tariff on, on long tapered candles, excluding candles for celebrations, specifically birthdays and weddings. America has the best <laughs> candles for celebration, eh? It's like, oh, we can't have the birthdays be more expensive. <laughs> that wouldn't be nice. That's not Canadian. <laughs> it was it was awesome when I read that. I'm like, they're so nice. Take the tariffs off them. They're nice people. Oh, it's just, it gonna be a, could you imagine like a black market and birthday cake candles? <laughs> I just listen. I want people to stop saying that Canadians are nice as a stereotype. They're actually nice. It's not a stereotype. It's a fact. I saw a candle in your window, ma'am. Are you having a birthday? <laughs> well, they, she should not have gotten the tariff, eh? <laughs> oh, boy. oh, by the way, looping back. See, it went to my it went to my spam filter, and I don't know why, but the GDP now, the federal Fed from Atlanta, they revised it this morning. The GDP now model estimate for GDP growth in the second quarter of 2018 is now up to 4.8%. That is a big jump. So I was going to say a big ass jump, but I don't want to fall into trouble with. We'll lose our show. All right. Uh, <laughs> we got to touch on a couple. Well, what's what's going on with oil? How how long do we want to make this oil segment? Uh, oil terrible. fell into oil fell into correction territory, and a lot of WTI did. And a lot of times, people don't look at crude oil the same way they look at markets. But there are bull market corrections in crude oils. Remember that corrections are a technical function. People like to think that there's all these people who don't believe in price action and technicals, and they'll say, "Well, you know, we reached some technical levels," but they only say that when they don't know what's going on, right? That's the only time they ever say that because they're not actually technicals. Crude oil fell from its high to its low, approximately 9.7% on WTI. Now, Brent did not do that. Brent's falling more than crude oil today. So the real big takeaway, first, let's talk about the sell-off. The sell-off comes from the rumor that Russia and OPEC are going to increase production. Now, that rumor came out a few days later. Uh, Khalid Al-Fahil, who is the Saudi energy minister, actually said, no, we haven't even talked about this yet. We can't take the production cuts away without talking about it first, and we haven't talked about it. So then we got a tiny bit of a rally. But the fall comes mostly in WTI because we've now got sort of a free reign for WTI for the guys who produce the shale. The price curve got high enough, the overall curve got high enough, where they could actually 
spend CapEx, and sell current inventories at good prices. So the shape of the curve is where front months are high and going out to two years, the back months are lower priced. Now you might think that that harms hedging, but it doesn't when the overall curve is high enough because the shale producers can sell current inventory at high prices and then hedge out future inventory at decent prices. And that's really all they look to do, right? And they do that from a basis of, you know, our future production, yeah, it's not gonna be fantastic prices, but it's good enough. So they need the whole curve to be high enough to be able to do that. When just the front month is up, they're, they're, they just can just sell current inventories because the whole curve is up. They're able to, they have an incentive to sell current inventory at current prices and an incentive to hedge out. So WTI is falling faster because there's this anticipation that the production is going to continue to spike at a, at a faster rate exponentially than it's been. Last week, we had a recount increase. Recounts are not out yet as we record this for this week. But last week, we had a double-digit recount increase, which falls into that narrative. Now, the um, API had a build in crude oil inventories. The EIA, I'm pausing here because I don't remember what the EIA did. I believe it was a draw. Uh, EIA report, yeah, they had a drop in crude oil inventories. After the Saudi Arabian government or the Saudi Arabian energy minister denied that Russia and OPEC had been talking about this, even though most people believe that to be true, uh, Brent rallied, but WTI didn't. That spread widened. When that spread widens, the way crude oil is priced is it's priced X shipping, like getting it to the point of use. So WTI and Brent have a spread because WTI is landlocked. There's a cost of transport in WTI that does not exist in Brent. Most Brent, which is Middle Eastern oil for the most part, uh, OPEC oil and Russia oil are near seaports. The oil is coming out of the ground near a seaport. So the transportation costs are less. So the crude oil is priced higher where WTI needs that spread because you have to pay for the, um, the transport of the crude oil to refineries or to direct export of crude oil, which we can now do. So that actually puts a floor under, under w, WTI because people demand the exports as the price falls. But right now we're out of export capacity. We're out of transport capacity, I should say. Pipelines are pretty much full and there's no rail cars to be had. So we're in a bit of a crisis with WTI where the inventories might start to build simply because they're pumping it out at a level that can't be shipped or that can't be transported. That probably means lower prices ahead for WTI. Now, if you look at a daily chart chart technically, we basically have broken through all of what Mike and I look at. We've got a forming double bottom in crude oil, and that double bottom is against a static R zone on the, on the daily, uh, but it's not against the dynamic R zone. The dynamic R zone is in the way. So, Mike, I don't know if you have an opinion on crude oil technically, but it's not. It's kind of in a, in a sort of 50-50 for the way I would look at it technically, and the fundamentals for, for WTI are probably lower simply because of that transport problem. Well, what's interesting is we have a trend line that started in last August mm -hmm. on the daily chart that's now been tested one, two, three, four, and today tested five times. If we close below this trend line, which at this point is upward sloping, so the day, it changes every day, but it's roughly, if we close below 66, yeah. Then I'm. I would be expecting the end of the clear path move would take us to 62. Okay. Uh, but we also have that potential double bottom against the dynamic R zone. But we need for that to trigger a close above uh, 68.67. But then it's a lower probability one since it's against the rotation zone. Yeah, I think it could happen because, again, the demand for WTI is now there because the spread the spread went all the way uh, through $10 between Brent and WTI. That's the highest since, like, 2013. Um, but if they can't get it out of, like, the Permian's a good example. The Permian Basin, which is the only one whose, whose numbers I have off the top of my head, they do about 3 million barrels of oil a day. They only have transport capacity for about 316 and they recently upped their production by 300,000 barrels month over month. If they do that again, that crude oil is sitting. It's just going to sit there because there's literally no transport. Trucking is the next step 
because you can't get rail cars. There just aren't any. And it takes two to three years to build them. And pipelines, there's not enough pipeline. So that's it. It just sits there. There's no fast solution for that. So the solution is probably for OPEC to come in and increase production. But they may not do it. It depends. I mean, they're they're winning this from a perspective of getting price where they want it to be prior to the Saudi Aramco IPO and getting prices where they want them to be to sort of repad their coffers. This is working really well for them. And there you have it. It is now had. You have it. It, it is had. Well, now we have to touch on one other thing that was big in the, and I need your take on all this, but we've it's changed sort of as this morning. We got Spain and Italy going on. Mm -hmm. Why has that been moving the markets this week? All right. So Spain was more about uncertainty. They were holding a no confidence vote for Prime Minister Rajoy. And he lost that no confidence vote, which solidified Spain's bonds. So that just tells you that it was more about uncertainty than it was about any sort of actual crisis. So he lost. He's being ousted. That means new elections for prime ministers for Spain. There's not a ton of uncertainty there. Spain does not look like it wants to spegs it. I like that, spegs it. Um, Spain doesn't look like that's going to happen. So that was all about uncertainty. Italy, on the other hand, so Italy's five-star party won a third of the vote, okay? Five-star party is technically sort of a, they're a populist party, but they're not really, they're not really hard right. They formed a coalition government with the party, they attempted to form a coalition government with a party that took third in the elections with 18% of the vote, which was the League. And the League is hardline populist. Like, they want to do an Italy leave from the Euro, right? So they nominated a, a university professor for finance minister by the name of Giuseppe Conti. So Giuseppe Conti is an 81-year-old professor at a university, and he is an outspoken critic of the Euro and the Eurozone. And he is an outspoken, I want us to leave the Eurozone person. So um, that was rejected. He was rejected as finance minister because that would be where he would have the most influence on that by President Sergio Conti. I'm sorry, Sergio Mattarella. Giuseppe Conti is the guy. So that really threw them into sort of political chaos, not economic chaos. But the, Italy has its own economic problems, but this was a political problem. So that forced, not forced, but caused the Five Star Party and the League to tell their supporters to take to the streets and protest and demand new elections and all that. And a lot of observers, including myself, were like, you just had an election. New elections to do what? Well, it was going to be a referendum on Sergio Mattarella. Well, instead, they gave this Giuseppe Conti the prime minister role, not the finance minister. So he has less of an impact on the outcome of Italy versus the euro, but he still sort of got a post. So now they got their coalition government. They start ruling today. Now, there still may be calls for elections six months from now, but this again took Italian bonds from a four-year high in yield of 3.14 back down to about 2.4, 2.5, which is probably still high but is a reasonable range. So that's all calmed down. Both Spanish and Italian um, stocks rallied. Now, George Soros said this is a bigger crisis than Greece. It's a bigger crisis because of the size of the Italian economy relative to the euro. It's the third largest economy in the euro. But um, it's been pushed off and delayed. So we saw, like a, we saw a euro rally, euro US dollar rally after these things sort of settled down. That's backed up a little bit, but, but that's more because of the strength of the dollar after the non-farm payrolls than it is in any sort of weakness of the euro. Um, the euro right now versus the U.S. dollar is down three quarters of one percent. I'm sorry, down uh, two, two tenths of one percent. The euro is down three quarters versus the sterling, but it's down two tenths of one percent right now. The sterling is strong. And that, again, is mostly because of the strength of the dollar, not because of the weakness in the euro. So that's sort of it, the synopsis of that. 
That was a very good synopsis. Well, there you go. I, I watch my countrymen very closely. I, I, I feel like I've learned. I'm now a learned man. By the way, as we're sitting here talking, Apple is close to a new high. Uh, and what's not? Let's see. What? Oh. Yeah, it's only 47, 48 cents away from making a new one. They have a developers conference in this week or something real close. We should rally into the conference, don't we? Right, and then, it, then you know, they didn't uh, invent a time machine, so everyone goes, oh, it's over. <laughs> That's just what happens. Yeah, the classic, classic formation, though, with the uh, sideways move yeah. and a rising rotation zone, then a launch out of that rising rotation zone. Yeah. Classic move. What would that put? I got to do it now. A projection. I have a projection off the weekly, Mike, of the one uh, one twelve and a half being one ninety eight oh five. But that's a weekly. I don't know if I'm projecting from the correct place. You know that. Let's stuff. see. I have the next projections for the upside targets after we get above one night. Uh, why does that? Think or swim. How about that Star Wars, Bob? Yeah, I, I I didn't. I saw yeah. I saw it. I I saw you didn't cover it, but it was not. It's not. Shouldn't you shouldn't have to cover that? TD Ameritrade put Disney and the weak star the weak solo numbers and how that was going to affect Disney and all that. And and I reached out to Stafford to say, hey, if the, you know, I can talk about Disney stock, but I I don't know how this movie is and how it would affect everything. And um, it was funny because they didn't bring it up, and I was kind of disappointed because I would have completely sounded like I was in the know. I have our Apple levels. What do we got? Next level, 194.11, then the following level, 197.85. Can you send me a screenshot of that chart? No. <laughs> now, what Apple has to do is they have to come out with a new keyboard for their notebooks that kind of pushes away the class action lawsuits that is coming at Apple really hard because their previous keyboards uh, are made of popsicle sticks and glue, and they're all falling apart. Unbelievable. I saw some of the toys in the store yesterday, and I thought of you. Where Stafford has been saying forever, it's about the toys, it's not about the movie, it's not about anything else, it's about the toys. Uh, and the park, the theme park. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. what is Disney stock doing? Let's see. It's still trading, it's trading just above critical support. Trading 99.48 although it couldn't hold 100 so now net, the, the critical support at this point is about 98 but that's so this, this is a retracement extension on this apple okay it's the next gan box levels higher yeah yeah i'm sorry that's what i mean i did a retracement extension and got 198.05 but that was on the weekly chart what's this chart daily daily okay i do want to talk I, it, far be it for me to bring up Elon on a show that didn't cover Elon, but there's a Twitter war going on now between um, Elon Musk and the CEO of Boeing. Did you know that? Yeah, I I was trying to keep it a little lighter. Don't start. <laughs> well, I don't, I, this is not. This is just funny because his name is De Dennis Muhlenberg, and he said they're going to beat Tesla to the moon, and Elon Musk basically said. Uh, uh, do it or bring it or something like that. So I'm sorry, to Mars, not the moon, Mars. And my question is, who's going to be the first one to bring somebody back from Mars? We could send somebody there now. <laughs> well, Elon, now you brought up Elon. He's not going to be happy with the, the uh, CNBC article just dropped that he's not going to be happy about. What does that one say? Oh, it's, you'll, I'll have to send it to you. It's it's talking about the fires they had back in April that halted in their in their sprayer boost that halted uh, Model Three production. That they they actually the fire that they handled internally, and they they denied that there was a fire. Fire we talked about. It. They handled it internally. The uh, fire department, the local fire department, the. Uh, the battalion chief headed out to the Tesla plant and Tesla security denied that there was a fire and they said there was no internal reports of a fire. Well, there actually was a fire. It's been the fourth fire in the spray boost in the last like three or something years. They, oh, it's just a, it's another big Tesla cover up and he's going to go on a freak out Twitter rant once he reads the article. He's never going to get good press ever again. No, he's not. 
He's, you know, and this ties in with all the OSHA because they're they're workers again because of all these safety violations that they're afraid to work there. They're afraid, you know. They it's just a you'll have to read the article, but this he's gonna he's gonna call CNBC fake news. We'll see. And oh, by the way, there's a German report that came out last night that says, without citing any facts, an article that uh, in his Twitter stuff that said. We suspect the Model 3 can be produced for even 28,000 euros. And Musk immediately retweeted, yay, we could probably make it, and he converted it to dollars. We could probably do the Model 3 for $28,000. <laughs> and that and all these businesses, oh, look, he's, the Model 3 cost is going to come down. Oh, Jesus. It, it was absolutely ridiculous what was going on last night. It was and then it was pumping the stock up. It, it was all this weird things going on again with, you know, yeah, you can't even produce a $35,000 one. Now you're going to say it's $28,000. It's... But he's now selling the $78,000 one. Yes. <laughs> and my favorite, and this ties back to consumer reports, my favorite in the thing, because they, they have it the same rating as the Prius and the Chevy Bolt of a 77 out of a hundred score and they list the starting price for the model three the one they reviewed as thirty five thousand dollars which you cannot buy the one they reviewed for thirty five thousand dollars and if they can't test the thirty five thousand dollar one because there's not one out there and it does not have the same fit or finish so you cannot list it at thirty five thousand dollars it's a sad day when consumer reports is fake news but it's a sad yeah. day it is i'm i'm, I'm you know i'm very dissatisfied with yeah. uh, because they're they're doing some very weird things. All right, I'm pulling the plug on the Elon segment. I caused it. My bad. You caused it. See what I did. you did? There'll be music over whatever I end up putting here, and the <laughs> Elon segment goes at the end anyway. Now, so it's all good. All right. See all right. You, Bob. I know. Well, on a very strong Jobs Day, I am Bob Aitino. Thanks, guys. And I'm Mike Arnold. We'll talk to everyone soon.